So Rubina, I thought was really interesting because you can see the colorations of Rubina. So that was again in the 20s and there's a couple of you know, variations here. But then she said the way it was done was it was pushed in and out of the furnace multiple times. And sometimes she called this one was one that was left in too long. If I had seen that, you know, just on my own, I would have considered it Amberina. And she said, yes, you know, that's, that's what it does look like, but that's not what it was meant to be. So, you know, a couple of these really just end up having two colors. She said, if it was done properly, you would see the different colors, like in the candlestick, you've got the blue is showing a lot. Um, you'll have a bigger variation. Um, and I would never have thought that that dated back to the 20s. Well, if you got a dollar, just lousy down. Know that I got rhythm that can suit your budget found. So today I am in Cambridge, Ohio, uh, heading back home at the end of my vacation. And can't be all about thrifting and buying, uh, even though that is a fun part. Also love the research. So I am here today at the Cambridge Glass Museum. Uh, see what I can learn. A lot of my flower frogs came from Cambridge. Uh, so we're going to see if they've got some designs that I've never seen before. And uh, hopefully they'll let me film inside. Probably won't, but wish me luck. So I'm inside the Cambridge Glass Museum and they've given me uh, permission to film and Anna is about to give me the start of the tour and I thought it might be interesting to hear a little bit about the history of uh, the Cambridge Glassworks. So. A Cambridge Glass, the factory was built in 1901. The first piece of glass came off the assembly line in 1902. You have to remember when this factory was built, it was considered state of the art. No other factory was as complete as this particular one. It was located roughly a mile catty corner from us, and it is unfortunately no longer there. But at it, it, its thriving times, it would have employed roughly 750 people with three shifts. We will be seeing a video today uh, that was filmed in 1950 of the actual workers at our factory making rose point uh, stems, and you'll get to see that process. You'll also get to watch them make uh, an heirloom bowl. That's the name of the pattern. When Cambridge first started out, they did pressed wares and pharmaceutical wares. And if their items were marked, they would have the words near cut inside of them. And I don't know if you can get a video of this, but there is a word in there, near cut. Okay, yep. After that, they started marking their items with a C and a triangle. And after that being at what point? Uh, probably in the 20s. Yep, I can get it. Okay. Perfect. Now, the ladies of high society that set these elegant tables decided they didn't like that C in there. It took away from their food presentation. <laughs> so the salesman went back and said, we've got a problem. The ladies won't buy it. So they ended up putting orange, or, well, not really orange, gold and black matte stickers on there, which that's all fine and dandy until you wash the piece of glass and then you don't know who made it. So I'm going to show you a few examples that will help you maybe determine Cambridge glass. This is a um, this is their ball pitcher design. Back in the 30s and 40s, everybody made glass ball pitchers. But Cambridge put four darts on theirs. And that's how you can differentiate theirs from someone else's. You may find this ball design as small as a salt and pepper shaker and as large as a water pitcher, which Cambridge does have the patent for that. Another pattern that Cambridge had, this is their keyhole pattern. And it could be either a candlestick, it could be a base for a vase. You may even see part of the handles here as a cream and sugar, or the whole handle like this for a serving tray. So when we go throughout the museum, you will see this particular shape quite a bit. Excellent. And if you want, you can sit down and we'll get you started with a video. Okay. Won't record the video, but that was a great introduction to Cambridge. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Anna. So Anna gave me a great tour of the museum. I'm going to try to remember as much as I can uh, that she showed. It was just too difficult to video the uh, what she was saying. Um, so they started making pharmaceutical wear and they continued making pharmaceutical wear throughout the existence of the company uh, so i was not aware of that and you can see the little gold and black tag you know there on the big apothecary jar 
So that kind of is what started things out. So these are some of the earliest patterns and the earliest introductions of color. So turquoise, uh, they changed blues a couple of times. So this was the turquoise that they started with. This was an example of the flashed glass that they had. Uh, they did have amber really early and also cobalt and a green. Um, so this was showcasing kind of the start. So we're at the you know, early 1900s, they started 1902. This is quote unquote real carnival glass. So they're you know, calling it carnival treatment because the bowl would have been done or all of these pieces would have been done also in clear or maybe in other colors. And so they did this from 1908 or in 1908, 1916, and the 20s. So you've got the introduction of their carnival glass. And I'm just gonna kind of scan. We're pretty much going in order by year. So you've got some more carnival uh, here. Sometimes we've got jumps of uh, individual collections. But so that again, so we're kind of in the teens, early teens. So then we get into the ebony. So again, this was we're in the teens again, so this started around the mid-teens, 1916, uh, but continued through the 50s. So this is the black glass in the different ways. So the gold, she said, was all done in-house. Some of the uh, platinum and white gold, which I don't know is here, uh, was done in-house, but when you got into these overlays, these were all sent out and done by another company that just specialized in the overlays. So the overlays could be similar uh, with other makers. Um, we talked about the keyhole uh, in the, her introduction, the little keyhole uh, patent. So that pops up a lot and even portions of the keyhole, but not always. You can see the vase that just has, you know, regular curved handles. So it's not like if it doesn't have the keyhole, doesn't mean it's not uh, Cambridge. And so Ebony, uh, I guess was first and then you move into some of their other colors. So we have what they called primrose was mid twenties, you know, early mid twenties. Helio, which comes back later. Uh, so this is the Helio that was introduced 1923 to the mid twenties. Um, Azure, Azurite is one of the blues. So this is different than the turquoise that they started with. Then getting into jade, and then what they called ivory. So these are what she said were the opaques. And then another color, Pomona green. That's down here. Oh, and Carrera, that was a color as well, that white. You can barely see the tag kind of faded on that one. So that was you know, mid twenties. See a lot of the etches that they did. Their uranium glass was actually marketed as light emerald. So you've got an entire case just begging to be lit by a black light. Uh, so their light emerald went into the early 40s. Mulberry was introduced in 1923, so it's beautiful purple. So Rubina I thought was really interesting because you can see the colorations of Rubina. So that was again in the 20s. And there's a couple of you know, variations here. But then she said the way it was done was it was pushed in and out of the furnace multiple times. And sometimes she called this one was one that was left in too long. And I even said, and I apologize, we're getting like a glare. Let's see if I can do it at an angle. Um, if I had seen that, you know, just on my own, I would have considered it Amberina. And she said, yes, you know, that's, that's what it does look like, but that's not what it was meant to be. So, you know, a couple of these really just end up having two colors. She said, if it was done properly, you would see the different colors, like in the candlestick, you've got the blue is showing a lot. Um, you'll have a bigger variation. Um, and I would never have thought that that dated back to the twenties. So that's Rubina. Then we jump into a little flower frog collection. I was very happy to see a um, couple that they did without the base, those were then used for lamp bases. So the same molds, but they were used for lamp bases. So I don't have uh, the Asian figure. I don't have that, that bird I'm missing. Uh, and then I have the other ones, but I don't have all the sizes. Oh, and there's the watermelon boy or the melon boy. I didn't, I don't have that one either in the back. He seems to be 
straddling a shell. If I, if I, I think I have seen him before and I thought that was a turtle, but it looks like a shell. Um, these I thought were fantastic. I actually, there was, there was one over in the ebony and I didn't highlight it. Uh, you can you'll see that. These were mannequin heads. And this one unfortunately has some damage, but she's like, they're so rare that they put a damaged piece in the museum because they have the black one and they have this one. And that's it. So we've got Bluebell, uh, Topaz, the Dolphin Candlesticks, and the Buddha. Another blue, so this is the clear blue uh, Cobalt, also in the 20s. Amber, which ran until the 50s, so it started in 24, ran to the 50s, so not all amber is 70s. This I'd never seen before. It's the it's basically it's the blue willow pattern, but done on glass in both green and in blue. Uh, Madeira and cobalt blue. This was a collection of perfume bottles, and they have a lot of things where they showcase, like Myrna Loy had a collection of Cambridge perfume bottles. Their peach blow, which seems to be almost blinding me right now. Um, you know, big collection of those, a lot of different pieces. I realized I was never gonna be able to make it through all of the cases without making this a very long video that would make everyone probably ill as I bounced around. Uh, and I remembered that this display existed in the back. So this is a single piece in order of all of the colors that they introduced through the years. So hopefully you can see some of the signs have faded, but you can see these are, these are some of the colors that I had already shown before I just decided that this was not, I mean, they had 10 times more cases than what, just what I already showed. Um, so this is one piece from each of the colors. And then these I were, are getting into the later colors, which I had not yet gotten to showing the different, uh, again, these are the colors, not the patterns of the bowls or talking about the etches. I'd never seen the ebon before that satin black. That's, that's gorgeous. And they had some pieces uh, done in gold. And then they did have, it was originally called confetti, and then they changed it to uh, Mardi Gras. Up to the latest pieces, you know, the violet that replaced the Helios in the 50s when they reopened. They closed in 54 and then reopened in 55 and only lasted a few years and closed permanently in 58. So the previous case showed all the colors. This is giving you an overview of some of the lines. Uh, so Caprice uh, became one of their popular lines. Uh, Everglade. I've sold a piece of Everglade, but didn't know that's what it was uh, with that leaf pattern. Um, you've got a, a comparison of whether something is etched or engraved or cut because they did do both. Uh, so this is also showing some of the etchings. And then this is how can you tell if it is Cambridge glass. So if you are interested in collecting Cambridge glass, this showcase captures some of the major shapes, etchings, engravings, and production lines that will enable you to identify pieces as you begin your collection. So you've got all of these. And then the bottom shelf is probably one of my favorites. This was the salesman sample. Being the huckster, I'm always interested in what people had to haul around to do their selling. And they had to carry all, I'm not 100% sure why, but they would carry all of these materials to show that the materials were used in making the glass. So I guess it shows some of the dyes, you know, some of the colors that they used. A little miniature model of a clay pot in which the glass was made. They had to take that. Uh, blow pipes, they'd show that. And then they would take a mold um, that was being used along with a production piece. And she said they would change out the mold every six months or so, so that the salesmen would have something different to show. So it's a huckster life. I scanned over this section when I was filming earlier and I forgot, I wanted to highlight it because had I seen any of these in the wild, I don't even know if I would have known they were glass. 
these are Cambridge glass lamps. And, you know, I, the case is closed, so it's hard to tell, but, you know, my hand goes about halfway up. So these are probably 12 inches tall, 14 inches tall. The owl is maybe 16 to 18 inches tall. Um, they're extremely rare, just that they really did not, you know, have them very often, you know, they don't come across them very often. Uh, so they have this one display all there. And I mentioned earlier, I'll just highlight it again because I just thought it was so beautiful. Um, this is the black uh, ebony glass. Uh, again, a mannequin head, and does not doesn't that look fantastic? And again, if I saw that in the in the wild from a distance, I would have assumed it was pottery. It's hollow inside, just like the amber one was. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. So for every stem piece that they made as a wine glass water goblet, any stemmed piece, there is a complimentary cordial glass made in the same style. So this case has every design, theoretically at least, every design to match one of their wine glasses or, you know, dinnerware, glassware. And she said that every year the museum, uh, when it's closed, it closes for several months in the winter, uh, they have to clean every case and everything in the case. And this is the case that is the most daunting because it's the same size as every other case, but has about 10 times as much content in it than anything, any of the others. I wanted to show this shelf um, because one, I just thought it was, these pieces are really sweet and I'd never seen them before. You know, familiar with the concept of snack sets. And these are just little tiny, tiny snack sets. I think she said they were crudite sets. So it still has a dimple in the plate which would hold the little cup. Um, but you can see the plate is significantly smaller, so it's not like a luncheon set. So I've never seen these before, but these are super sweet and would make a fun collection because they don't take up that much space. So at one point on a business trip, uh, Mr. Woolworth approached uh, the owner of Cambridge trying to get him to work for Woolworths and uh, or actually you know, leave the company and become part of Woolworths. And he chose not to do so, but he said, hey, I'll help you out and I will make these little glass animals which you can sell at the Woolworth store. So I've seen some of these before and I've actually you know, heard them talked about the fact that these are Woolworth um, items, but now you can kind of see this was the entire range. So if you see a small animal, if it's not one of these molds, it's uh, probably not a Cambridge Woolworth piece. So evidently their partnership with the Sears catalog only existed in 1921 and 1927. Uh, so you can see some of the pieces that they had available. So in 1921, this 13-piece punch bowl set sold for $7.65. A 36-piece of Whirling Star glass assortment was $9.50. As you move up, the 1918 catalog well, they didn't list the 1918 catalog in that little sign, so maybe they did other catalogs too. So this was a 1918 catalog, um, complete China, 60 pieces for $6.98. But here's an actual, the pages from the 1921 catalog um, that showed what they had on offer. And uh, the 1927 catalog, uh, page back there. Colored glassware is correct. And you've got a little dollar twenty-five for the colored glass fruit or flower bowl. And then here you've got a bonbon dish with a bud vase in the center for a dollar twelve. Some more pieces and what they sold for in the catalog. So you can date the forms and just see what they thought was popular enough to cross over into a popular catalog like Sears uh, at, at these prices. I thought this one was fun to show because it's the experimentals. So first we had a bunch of end of day pieces that there was a family that would make these um, memorial pieces, cane toppers, um, that uh, were made, I think, by a set of brothers. Uh, or no, by, I guess, Charles Dagenhart. And so he would do these at the end of the day, and then he would just pay Cambridge for the amount of glass that he used. So um, 
those are the only paperweights that ever came out of Cambridge. But all these other pieces are typical forms that already existed, but they you know, t tested some of the glass formulas to see if it was something they wanted to pursue. Some of them are attractive, some of them not so much. Uh, so in some cases, the reason they weren't continued could have been they just weren't as popular of a look, or they may have been too difficult to maintain the formula. Uh, there's a couple of examples where, as uh, even you know, in a production line, you start putting pieces together. Whoever, as she said, whoever mixed the formula that day, sometimes it's a little bit darker, sometimes it's a little bit lighter. So some of these may have just been too hard to produce. But it's kind of fun because if you see... Uh, one of these pieces, if you have one of these pieces in one of these colors, because they were typically, she said, about, like, you know, three to five made uh, as the test, you might not even realize you've got something that is, uh, is pretty rare. So these are some of the larger flower frogs, which are definitely uh, impressive. So you've got the larger draped lady with the flower frog base. Uh, but this was one I hadn't seen before. So this is the flower frog on a candle base. So she still would hold flowers and there's a place for a little bit of water down there. Um, but you know, you wouldn't be able to really fill this with water. So it seems questionable what kind of flowers you would have put into the flower frog, but it then would have had four tapers. So it's uh, one that I had never seen. I kind of question its utility, but um, Maybe you could have a bowl in there too if it didn't wrap over the candles. I don't know. But I'm sure they know what they're doing. That was what they were marketed as. And uh, it is a very impressive piece. And then also done with a blue, with a, uh, in one of their blues. So when Mr. Arm took over the factory in the 40s, these were in production. They're little glass um, bulldogs. French bulldogs, what are these? Well, we're going to call them... Bri they're pencil dogs or bridge hounds in the shape of a dog. And so you can see they are made out of glass, obviously, and they have a place to hold a pencil. And you see all the different shapes. So these were available in production, so you could buy them as well. But then if you got a tour of the factory in the 40s, you could have gotten these as a gift. And uh, one of the tips is that they're very hard to find in perfect condition because guess what? They're the perfect shape for putting into a slingshot. And uh, so they tend to have a lot of damage on them for when the kids found them. But I am buying one of these because they have one in their very own gift shop. And I'm excited because I'm taking one home. So this is, again, I'm in their education room. And so this is a finished swan punch bowl. And it is made in the swan punch bowl mold. So you can see this is a very large mold. It has one, two, three pieces. So when people talk about a three-piece mold, um, this is you know getting an idea of how this would be. This would close together. It's hinged at the back. It would close together. And you can see there's a hole here. And then that would slide into this piece here. So this would lift up this piece would slide into the middle of this piece and this piece and then the pin would go down that would hold it together and you would pour the molten glass into this mold and then cap it with that piece there and she said that as you can imagine these molds were extremely heavy so basically if you were the glass maker you would get this mold and it would sit on your bench she said probably for about 30 days and you would do nothing but make glass swan punch bowls in different colors and you know whatever you needed to do but that's all you did because they couldn't take the time to try and move these molds from place to place so um it's uh it's definitely a definitely a uh, heavy and uh, heavy job and it's gonna be a hot job too because of all the molten glass and so in some cases you probably would end up not wanting to see a punch bowl after you'd made them a couple dozen a day for 30 days so we are in the kids' area, um, but, you know, I'm still a kid at heart. And these are the original etching plates that were made by... Uh, she told me his name, and now I can't figure out which one he is. Walter Gugold. He worked from home, and he would just sit here and make these etched, these etched plates. And this was plate number 3130 for a goblet. So you can see... 
the design. Um, the video, which I'm, she wasn't sure if it's available online, so I'm going to try and find it because I couldn't videotape it. Uh, but I'll showcase. I'll look at the show. I'll show the showcase again and see if I can try and explain the process. But basically, they would ink this and then put like a tissue over it, and then this would be applied to the glass, and then. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to describe it. But anyway, these are the etches. So this is what they would use, and these are the original ones. Uh, these are all dating from about the 50s. And it is the kids' area, so you can make your own etch. Let's see if I can do this. All right, I just made the bottom of, what did I make? There's little instructions etched into this. So this plate was for, I have no idea. Cut here. So I gave instructions of how to do it, although they may not all have gone together because I don't know if this house pattern would have necessarily gone with these two designs over here. So it may have just been how they fit together. Um, but anyway, I've got my own little Cambridge etch. All right, so I'm gonna try and do my best to replicate uh, what is in the video, but I did just find out the video is available online. So I will have a link to that in the notes section of this video. So when they pour the glass into the mold, this is how the goblet comes out with this little section at the top uh, that's just kind of left over. Um, you know, the, basically it's the pontal. They attach the stem at that point, so you still have the little excess glass at the top, and then they attach the stem to the base, and they still have the little excess at the top. Um, they then have a machine, and you, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. You can kind of see there's a little fine line that goes just under the bend at the top of the goblet. It has been scored to then be able to be cut. Um, they put it on a little turntable with a flame uh, heating it so that it makes that cut go all the way through, and then they just lift the top off. So you've got the goblet after. Um, the top is lifted off. It is then... Uh, the edge is grounded down, so it's no longer sharp. They then glaze the edge, which I don't remember what that means. Um, so that happens. Then this is getting etched. So they, those uh, plates that I showed you have this little design. So they have the tissue paper. So they do something with the black... Um, adhesive or whatever that they put onto the plate, they put the tissue on that and then apply the tissue onto the goblet. They then remove the tissue, so then what you're left with is the design surrounded by the black stuff that they use to pick up the, um, to make the pattern. You then have to cover the rest of the glass that doesn't want to be etched it's covered in beeswax so that glass is showing it's cut and covered in beeswax they have these out of order so that one so you do that you remove the tissue you add the beeswax then you jump back to this one because now you've got the beeswax on the inside so you did the beeswax on all the outside pieces, then you have the beeswax on the inside, So they, because you don't want that to be etched either. You then dip, they attached it to a plate, and then dip the entire thing into a vat of acid, which is then etches the design into the goblet itself. So that's how you get the finished goblet. So a many, many, many step process, but you end up getting an absolutely gorgeous piece by the time you're done. I'm going to try and film this in a way that we don't see the glare, but this is something you don't see every day. It is a recreation of a holiday-themed table decorated entirely in Cambridge. 
So you've got the Cambridge glass, plates, drinkware, even the chandelier, uh, the hurricane in the center were made here in Cambridge and then the uh, lamp was made by another local company. They did a lot of partnerships. And you've got the little candy or a compote, fruit compote here on the side. So they change it out every year. This was the year of amber and uh, I guess they've got the collection to make it make it different each year. So this is a fun recreation. They found the original door of the Cambridge sample room and all the original furniture and the original clock from the uh, original uh, Cambridge sample room. And every one of these pieces is for sale, literally for sale now. So you can see there's price points on all of them. Um, from what I understand, the museum is basically run by the collector's club. And so that was Anna was the tour guide. You know, she's a member of the club. So here's a little brochure on Rose Point that lists all of the patterns that are available in Rose Point. So that's only $3. Um, but I have a Cambridge book that I think has that. But you can kind of see it names all the patterns. This one happens to be Rose Point for the candlestick, you know, because the candlestick has the regular form, but then it's etched with the Rose Point pattern. Another Rose Point little dish. So they also have the pamphlet for this one's Porsche. Uh, Chantilly pattern is all up here. Diane. One of the um, tips that she gave, not tips, just one of the things she happened to mention because her son uh, was traveling in Australia. All of the pink Diane for whatever reason, all of the pink Diane was shipped to Australia. So you won't typically won't find pink Diane here. Um, you'll only find it there, but they know how valuable and rare it is. So it's hard to find even in Australia. Uh, so a lot of clear, you know, because that's probably what, you know, a lot of people that are making it available and what's available for them to pick up and resell here in the gift shop. Uh, you got a lot of clear, but just a great variety that, you know, again, this cases are wonderful, but you can just do kind of a really good analysis of all the pieces and start familiarizing yourself of what Cambridge really had to offer. Holy cats, this was so much fun. I loved this museum. It is just a glass lover's paradise. Uh, Anna was so pleasant and so knowledgeable and gave me so much of her time. I really wish I could have done more of the video, uh, but hopefully I captured enough of it. And uh, I got stuff in the gift shop, so I'm pretty happy. Uh, so this is in downtown Cambridge, Ohio. It is the National Museum of Cambridge Glass. I'm filming in a different direction because across the street's a funeral. And if I did, if I stood where I was standing at the introduction, it would look like I was filming their their funeral, which I thought would be rude. So I'm. You know, got a little entrance sign here instead. So it is closed during the winter, but it is now open. It opens at nine o'clock in the morning. Can't remember when it closes. Um, not sure how many days a week. They've got a website. Check it out. And I uh, found out that all of their gift shop items are donated, uh, so they resell them. That is how they make money for the museum. So if you ever find yourself with a set of extra Cambridge glass that you don't want and you don't know, you're not sure what to do with it, ship it to the National Cambridge Glass Museum. They will definitely use it. If they don't have one on display, it'll go into the display. And if they do have one on display, it'll go in the gift shop and will help make them money. And they're a 501c3 organization, so you can even write it off. So uh, this is the end of my trip in Cambridge, heading west, and uh, we'll see where I end up next. Thanks for uh, checking out my channel. Thanks for uh, giving me your time, and thanks for putting your trust in Trusty Huckster. Talk to you later. Bye. Well, show me a sign if you're wishing me to stay. Otherwise, I say goodbye and finish out the day. That sunrise in the morning and you got nothing to say Oh, that's when I'll be headed on my way